I think we're ready to start. Um, so opening the meeting of the Montpelier Roxbury uh, Board of School Directors um, at 6.38. Um, first order of business is public comment. Hearing none. Um, consent agenda, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move to approve the consent agenda. Do you have a second? I second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We, is it okay that it just says resignation, oh. so we got a new one, do we have to do something different or it just falls in there? It falls in, falls in good. Yeah. Okay. Actually, May I have a question on one item in the consent agenda. So do I. <laughs> we take back that one. Yes. 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 Um, there, I, I flagged something. There was an issue with something in the minutes. Anna, is that corrected for this version? The attendance for the finance committee? Yeah. Uh, no, it is not corrected in the current packet you have, but will be corrected. Okay. Do we, does that require any action from us? I don't know. Um, the only change in the minutes is I was not present at the finance committee. Oh. And Anna's going to correct that. You were there in spirit. <laughs> that, that, that is true. <laughs> right, is there anything in there around? <laughs> Ghost? <laughs> but anyways, minor thing, but that was... So it's a, I, think, I think it's a clerical error. Too. It's clerical, it's typographical, it's not a big deal. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, Our parliamentarians. A really That's easy fine. question. I have a... What? A really, maybe an easy question. It says the first day of school is August 24th, but then August 24th has this funky box around it, and I don't know what that means. Oh, yeah, it's the first and last oh. day of school. Oh, the funky box. that's for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't see that legend. Yeah. Thank you. So that is in response to um, EDA compliance and visibility on their website. Just uh, like, I'm curious why the change from all colors. It's, it's a better system. I'm glad you said that, though, Michelle, because that's we were starting on the 25th and ending on the 16th. The one that's in here is the 24th and the 15th. I'm glad you said that, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's with the three plus three days. So we should, no days. So this should not be approving this calendar? No, so we should not be approving this version. Okay. That we already approved. We haven't approved yet, I haven't voted. No. Ooh. We did vote. We did vote. Sorry, we should put it in the wrong line. Yeah, you put it in the wrong line. Sorry. Yeah, we've got enough mess here. Maybe just to, like, what's the process for? Unwinding. <laughs> there is. <laughs> Unvoting? Yes. Can you move to reconsider? Oh. Yeah. Move to, Let's reconsider the consent, consent agenda. agenda. I move to reconsider the consent agenda. <laughs> <laughs> Second. I'm favor. so glad you said that, Michelle. Okay. We went through multiple versions of the calendar, and the one we ended on is starting on the 25th and ending on the 16th. And is the 24th a teacher day? 24th is, a, is an open day. So nobody has to be anywhere right. on the 24th. Right. Okay. I have a lot two, of teachers will use it as a discretionary. I have two suggestions. I mean, one is we can put off approving the calendar until our next meeting if it's not considered urgent. But I do no, know that people, considered. well, it is their parents already yeah. asking yeah. about yeah. it. It's, we could, if it's possible, to generate the correct one while we're doing other things in the meeting, we could come back and revote. I, I have it at my desk. Yeah, I just happened to put in the wrong one. Oh. I'd be inclined to try to revote the correct calendar, given that people are already asking about it. If you, Jim, if you feel like that's... It's just that have, one little mistake. Yeah. Can we approve it with the with that change? And then we're done and everybody has some concrete planning skip tools? You mean approve it without seeing it? Well, is it just the one change? It's, well, two, two, two changes. Start and end. Start start and end it. I, I don't mean to cause more trouble. I'm thinking the more... Concrete, we get families as soon as possible to better, that's all. Well, she was suggesting that she just bring us back the, the right one in 20 minutes or something. Oh, even better. I was thinking next week. Okay. 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 Sorry about that. Bridget still had a question. Mm -hmm. yep. So my question about the minutes was just um, more general, and I meant to bring it up last week and forgot, and I just thought I'd bring it up since Andrew brought up a question about the minutes. I think we've been, there's been a number of times where the minutes recently have said things like the board agreed 
is what in, have said have used language in the in the discussion along the lines of the board agreed or it was agreed it was agreed and I think we have to be careful about that in the minutes because there really isn't any board agreement unless we take a vote on something the minutes as they are are far more detailed than they need to be the minutes really just need to be a record of decisions yes. made agreed. and I know that it's it's nice for transparency to add more but but as you add more you bring up bring in um, clarity yeah and I just need that feedback she just never took them before yeah <laughs> yeah that's all I, I would say though even though you're only recording the decision sometimes we've had a discussion and then later on we try to think what we had the discussion about and we can't remember so if there was some two-liner <laughs> that said something about the discussion I'm, I'm trying to suggest an in-between it would be more like a discussion occurred. Is that what you mean? The board, the board discussed. discussed. Yes. Yeah. Like the board discussed the data regarding gym usage and questions raised by the community about gym usage. And I, there's Not a there's many levels of, of the discussion. Discussion you could get to, but when it gets to the level of it was agreed or the board considered no, this or viewed important. it this way, it's going I think beyond what you could put in the minutes. If there's no vote. And sometimes I know like it'll say like. Steve Hinchin said this, and I feel like that it's nice to be on the record, but it really doesn't matter what's being said by any one member of the discussion because it has no weight. And plus, then you really feel like you need to read it. <laughs> right. Sure you want to that I really <laughs> said it. It's a real issue here, Michelle, <laughs> as she leaves the board. <laughs> well, and we have recordings on file. Yeah, of the, yeah there are videos. So if we videos. need to go back to some issue, we can go yeah. back to that. Yeah. I can give her that feedback. Yeah, less is more. Easier for her. Much easier yeah. for her. Yeah. 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 yeah, she's typing like mad. Well, you might just give her examples of um, Heather's minutes too, mm -hmm. which were actually also overly detailed. <laughs> but 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 not not as much. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. But I, I do think it is good to note at least discussions because sometimes when I have. We Sometimes I have forget. one vote. Right. Yeah, Even you young people forget. <laughs> okay, so that's not an action that needed. That was just a comment. So, do you want a motion to approve the consent agenda without the calendar, or do you want to just redo the whole consent agenda when we get the calendar back? Uh, let's do a motion to approve without the calendar, and then we can approve the calendar when it comes back. I will move that we approve the consent agenda without the district calendar. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? So here's on a vote, if, if I, if we don't get, because I, I stopped it. I didn't say any opposed the last time. That's still a vote as soon as you have a majority, and if you don't complete the vote. Oh, I, I thought you had done the whole thing last time. I hadn't, I hadn't gotten to the days. Oh. Huh? Oh. So we got off the vote. So. But it was a unanimous aye until people started saying, hey, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean that aye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, we will approve the rest one and um, it's back. Um, monitoring reports. Yes, so we have two monitoring reports. Travel reimbursement, the ever exciting one. Exciting. <laughs> we're we're uh, we're following that policy to the T. In fact, even, I think more to the T than it actually needs to be. Um, and participation of home study. Pull up that monitoring report. Um, I'm happy to take any questions about that. That the numbers are there, which is part of the policy um, that we have. I have two questions. Go for it. <laughs> on the second page about participation of home study students, mm -hmm. number three says students must participate in the following three areas. Um, that's like that's like saying um, these are, if they if they want to participate, these are the areas of participation allowable. Oh, okay, it reads like. They have, have any home to study to kids. Anybody Sorry. that wants mm -hmm. to participate must take phys ed, health, and fine arts. And I knew that couldn't no. be true. No, no, no. Seems like it should say yeah. students. It's more like choices. I can fix that up. Because yes, I can understand how it reads that way. 
And, and my other question is curiosity, which almost all school boards ask, which is, do we know why these students are homeschooled? No. Okay. <laughs> no. I mean, how would we find that? Seems well, kind of intrusive. It, 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 it is, but sometimes um, there's an underlining reason why more students would choose not to be in the school but somewhere else. And clearly we don't know one. I'm just asking. I'm curious. Maybe a ballpark idea. So these are home study students. Mm -hmm. Do we have any idea how many students are outside in other placements, like a Catholic school or um, another private education? Center? I can get that number for you. I don't know it off the top of my head, but I can get that number. I believe I can get that number for you, maybe. Okay. I don't think they actually, maybe I can't, because they, they don't have to register with us if they're registered in a different school. Sure. They're not, these are still, they have to register, we have to have them on, or they have so to recognize that they are this, or their resident school mm -hmm. if they're home study, but if you go somewhere else, I don't think you do. Okay, Bridget? So these numbers reflect all of the students in the district that registered with AOE as home study students, whether or not they are engaging in a district, right. in a district activity. Right. I just want to make sure I understood that. And like, then the number yeah, below, below says Main Street study. Middle School has one home study student taking PE. And that's the only one of these that are involved in the school. Was yeah, last year we had a few more at high school, but we don't have that this year. Yeah. Another thing about home school is they have the ability to participate in our co-curricular. Is that right? Yes. Do we have any record of the numbers of homeschools who are using our athletics or co curricular programs? I don't know that number. I Maybe. don't believe. I don't. It's not a lot. Yeah, no. I don't know that number. And then um, it, it's not by any means urgent, but just it'd be interesting over time to track some of these things longitudinally, like over time to see whether our numbers are going up, down. Well, we will with the policy monitoring. Right. You know, as because, long as we keep it all the same, yeah. Yeah, because I have the same policy monitoring for last year, so we, we most yeah. definitely will be able to do that. It's Actually, part of a policy that I have to show the yeah. numbers each year. I was going to say it might be interesting to see them column-wise. So well, last year, next to this year, next to uh, next year. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so, so you can see the trend. Data. Yeah. yeah. So, but, and then the other is, I think AOE probably keeps track of, of students in private. Right? They might. I don't know. So. They must know because they're how many students are enrolled in these yeah. authorized educational facilities. But they, they might they not know it by number, number, but they might not students. know that they were from my right. right. Because all students ages 6 to 16 are required to be in school, yeah. and you've yeah. got to know yeah. where they are. These are all excellent well, questions. I do not know the answer to. Uh, they should know other schools as well. Mm -hmm. They should know other schools as well. Too. Right, that's what I'm thinking. Right, but I wonder where there's a list of Montpelier resident people six between to 16 year olds. six to yeah. 16. It's beyond child count. Right, I'm not sure there is one, is what I was saying. Right. We had this in re relation to why or. We had this discussion once at the board about um, Catholic schools and and private schools and whatever is like wonder why someone would choose that. So is, I was there, asking sort of the is same. there a way of finding out? Otherwise, yeah. we just have numbers. Yeah, you you really don't have a yeah. way of knowing unless something comes up that the superintendent might not might know that I wouldn't. That would be she's had four or five people come in and say. I'm going to such and such because of X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Which has not but, happened. Right. I assume that. But. Um, do we have a motion to approve the money for the discussion? Do you have a motion to approve the policy monitoring reports? We make the motion to approve both the policy monitoring reports. I have a second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Policy. Monetary reports approved. And um, learning focus. So, Eve? Yes. So, today Hope isn't here, so I'll just be saying some things around something she wanted me to add. 
So for student celebrations, we have um, the very first Black Lives Matter flag has been framed in the main lobby along with the testimony given to the board. And this is just to remind us of the day that MHS raised the flag and the importance of continuing to spread the message and education behind Black Lives Matter. And going along with that, um, the RJA has decided to hold affinity groups, which are basically like small group meetings after school for students of all races just to continue to talk about race issues and to foster more diversity and inclusion and maximize the impact. Um, Club you want to explain what RJ is? Okay, yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's the Racial Justice Alliance. It's yeah. And Main Street Middle School is raising the flag on Friday morning. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Club Interact students cooked food for the warming shelter last week and volunteered to host. So it's good to see students getting more involved with the community and stuff. Um, and for student issues, I've talked to a lot of students and a large concern is the current health curriculum. And it's kind of hard because health is a very wide topic and it's hard to be inclusive and get education for everything you need to. And, um, but currently the big issue they talked about was it's pro-abstinence in the health curriculum currently and there's not a lot of discussion on safe sex and safe LGBT sex and um, birth control options, which is really important when you're a teen and you're growing up. And um, it's very important to make it more inclusive, and I know that they're trying to do that, but there are ways that we could strive to be better at doing that. And we just want every student to feel safe and have a good sense of belonging and know about safe sex practices and mental health issues. Um, Another issue is students leaving food around the school, which I know Renee tried to address, but there was some, yeah, some backlash with that. Yeah, yeah um, but some students have expressed concern with not feeling comfortable in the school's cafeteria, so I think it would be good to have a group of students brainstorm some ideas of making it a safer and more comfortable place. Um, and the last thing Hope wanted me to add here was Lindsay Hallman with Up for Learning will facilitate youth adult partnership retreats with MHS and MSMS students and teachers who are working on restorative practices. And yeah, that's all I have. Okay. Questions for you? Yeah, um, the cafeteria, um, you just mentioned some students don't feel safe there. Yeah. Uh, can you expound upon that without putting any students in there? Right. Um, I think it's just very like clicky and stuff, and a lot of students feel that they don't have a place where they can comfortably and like safely eat without feeling like they don't belong. And it's honest, it's like an ongoing issue, and I know it's like obviously going to happen clicks and stuff, but I think there are definitely ways that we could improve on it and so students feeling the need to not eat in a place where they should feel safe too. Do you have, are there any solutions out there? Not, around? Yeah, not yet. That's why I think it would be good to like organize a group to discuss things about that. Do you think a student-led effort would be the way to drive a solution or is there any I'm just thinking from a board member's perspective, it's something I'm concerned about, but I'm thinking about where's our angle here versus where's the student's angle, teachers, right. administrators. I think definitely starting with like a student group and then generating ideas and then moving off of that. There are big tables, so if you come into the cafeteria, you have to choose to sit at a table. Yeah. Which might not have people you want to sit with or might not have people sitting at it that want you there, right? Yeah. That's an issue. We, we had a former administrator years ago who made the observation that um, when he was hired, people welcomed him and said, you're going to love MHS because there aren't clicks. And he's like, that's ridiculous. There are clicks everywhere. <laughs> but then what he observed was that there's like one huge click because you guys are together and have known each other forever. So like, if you can fit into the big click, like everybody's pretty friendly to each other, but if you don't fit into that big click, 
you're really stuck outside. Right. Is that yeah, an accurate? Yeah. yeah. And so the challenge for all the time that I have been aware of this is how to create an inclusive environment for those kids that can't get in. It's tricky because they're all different kinds. You know, it's not like one group that's excluded. It's the kids around the edge that can't get in. That are really isolated. Well, the physical, the physical makeup of a cafeteria has, has a lot to do with how people feel comfortable. It's true in the middle school, too. It's the same issues to some extent. So, you know, that the reconfiguring, if necessary, of the, the physical space makes, can make a difference. Or well, maybe new furniture. Well, that's maybe what it takes, but it, it takes some thought. I mean, it's not just break it down into little tables. Right. There's, no, no. there's more to it than that. I had a question about the health thing. Yeah. Well, maybe about both things. What's your, what is your avenue? Or, or you, these issues are great, and they're issues we've heard, you know, for a while to some extent. And I'm wondering, do you feel like you have an avenue to, to talk to the principal or, or, or have an impact when you feel, for instance, the health curriculum is something we are talking about, and the administration is focused on a little bit. And there's like a, you know, and it's in the middle school, so it's not a new concept. But where is your ability to influence that at the high school? Where do you feel like you can actually insert your your values or opinions? Yeah, I feel like a lot of students have these opinions, but they don't necessarily know like what to do with them, so they usually just keep it to themselves. But I feel like if we establish um, a good person or place that they could talk about these issues, people would definitely like organize themselves and find solutions or ways they would like to improve stuff because the health issue I noticed only came up between like other students and they just they don't really know where to go from there because they just accept it so I think just establishing a good person like a faculty member would be a good solution to that. Is that Health curriculum in, in high school is it is it the class in ninth grade? There's a class in, in high school, right? There's the one that it's often taken first year. Is there another required health class, or no, is it just that one just semester? It is that the health class you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Is there integration between the health curriculum in the middle school and the high school? So yeah. There's a flow. Right now, we have a health curriculum committee with parents, yeah. Planned Parenthood, teachers on it. That's Mike's leading. Mike Berry's leading. Yeah. So it's it's in the works. process. Yeah. And so what is what is the current curriculum? And what does it? Uh, and it's a big question, but like, where would we go to find out what exactly is being taught? Because when I hear here in the high school, it'd be the program of studies. Okay. Um, in the middle school, we're working on that. There isn't any formalized document. And like, what does pro abstinence mean? <laughs> You'd have to look at the program of studies and ask the teacher, because um, I don't know enough about it from the pro-abstinence perspective. Is, is it like part of a menu, or is it like the preferred option? I have not been there during the class. I don't know, because I have not been there during the class when the conversation yeah. is happening. Oh, it's been a while for me. <laughs> <laughs> Three years. Just, yeah, I, I talked to some freshmen who were in the class in my TA, and yeah, that's basically what okay. it is. I don't know about high school, but I do know, even though it was a while ago, about middle school. And this is a hot button issue, not only for the students, but the parents. Because parents differ greatly on what they think you should teach or not teach their children. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but they're not all evidence-based. Yeah. I mean, we, I'm just saying, we, it's just a hard I've decision. had five meetings with parents about curriculum, all of them around health, none of them around reading, math, science, or social studies. <laughs> <laughs> and all five of them had a very different perspective of what should be the focus of, in health, mm -hmm. depending on where they were coming from and what their student is experiencing mm -hmm. in their life, not in health class necessarily, oh, but see. in their life. Right. Very personalized no, that's for what's working. Right. Mm -hmm. Or what's needed for individual kids. Yeah, right. And health is just really one part of a, you and Mike are really looking to kind of re-envision how, how curriculum 
um, is oriented within our district. I don't know if you want to touch upon that while we're on this subject. Just to well, when we took over a year and a half ago, there was no curriculum. Okay. There were a program of studies that, at the high school level, that would that may or may not be connected to the standards we're required to teach. Um, the middle school again had something written down in multiple Google Docs, not in one area. Like you couldn't find it if you wanted to find it. Um, and again, it may have been connected to standards we're required to teach, but most likely it wasn't. Um, There's was nothing. So we focused on math first because that's a relatively easy, easy, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. It's linear. Target. <laughs> um, we're working on reading slowly and health right now. We are also working on PE, art, music, that the specialists right now. Um, because we can tar we can tag target that those teachers in a different way as classroom teachers. So we're targeting that work. Um, the health got pushed to the top because of the um, demand from community. I personally I think our reading curriculum might need to be pushed further up, but that's not the priority right now from the community. The community is the health curriculum. We don't have a lot of time in health class, and if you add more time, what do you take away is a big question. Um, and uh, again, I've, fi I've had five meetings, and each of those five meetings had a different perspective, either mental health or only solely LBGQ+, or solely um, sex and consent and that kind of thing, or solely not sex in any way, shape, or form, or drugs and alcohol. Those are the five biggies. So, and each parent was equally as passionate <laughs> in their in their argument or whatever their cause was. We also had a group of students come to the board asking mm -hmm. for changes in the health grade. Yeah. So, so Mike's working on it. He has the committee together. He meets often with them. And how, like once a month is he working now, or twice a month? I feel like he's wor working on it quite a bit right now. If the health curriculum team which there's lots of things that are happening, but that one is uh, forming, the group is forming, it's just been identified who's in that group, and their, their first meeting will be. Started. He's been meeting individually with yeah. the members, with the members of that team for the past two months to get people's perspective and get them relatively in the same boat, rowing in a direction. On the other hand, Mike has nice piles of... Yeah, you see all that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, so it's not health, but it's you know, yeah. math. We're formalizing it, we're working yeah. on it. It's a big pile. There's a lot of work to be done yes. in the curriculum area, which is one of the pillars we stand on. Yeah, and we need to stand on. No, yeah, and, and health is, is, health is very important and it's very tricky, but like all five of those issues you just mentioned are things that are still relevant in my daily life, and I can't tell anything about calculus, so. Right. <laughs> uh, so. True. But we're Even glad you can it. read. Huh? But we're glad you can read. I can read. <laughs> but what I read in ninth grade English, I couldn't tell you that other thing, except I think To Kill a Mockingbird, but it was very important. I'm not diminishing reading, because we do need reading for reading, but I, yeah, it, it touches yeah, right. really important things that carry through our lives. So. So does so does uh, everything else? Financial literacy. So does you know there yep. there are other things too that are not requirements either. So it's it's not an easy no. conversation when you get a packed schedule in a small school. Yeah. So is the is the issue that we haven't as a community come to a consensus over what percentage of our day we want to spend on? Because it feels like I'm feeling some pushback from you, and I think that's healthy. But um, what I'm saying is I feel like. You're feeling it's taking it's taking up too much space, and I don't mean that in a bad way because I think that we have to always find those balances. Um, but I want to be careful because there's so much concern from students and parents mm -hmm. about this being a high priority for them. So, which is why it's moved to the top. No, I, I get yeah. it. I'm not, I feel like you're respecting that, but what I mean is. You also, there's a feel some tension there from you. And I there just, absolutely is tension yeah. in the sense that we don't have the time in our schedules or days to uh, to truly do justice to all the pieces around how to have a healthy life in one class or in one middle school section that they do twice, I think, in middle okay. school. But mm -hmm. Libby, so I've had two kids go through all of the, the maximum amount of health education you can in this district 
and there is a lot of room for improvement absolutely. within the time available. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's totally what I agree think with the you. issue might totally be. Totally agree with you, Michelle. Nowhere built is here. It? Is totally it? agree with you. And, and what I've talked to Jim about is that there's a difference between curriculum mm -hmm. and pedagogy, yeah. right? And, and supervision and evaluation all, of said all, pedagogy. All that yeah. Stuff. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. I totally agree with you. Yeah. I mean, that's the living hearing. The concerns that you brought forward and listening to you know what the parents are bringing to you it might not necessarily need to be more classes but maybe more avenues for the students to access mm -hmm. quality information source Resources. i don't know if it's more guidance counselors or social workers or a health instructor like a an mm -hmm. open office that somebody can come into and have those very specific questions on whatever the mm -hmm. myriad of health concerns might be in their life right then yeah and U32 just took up birth control like a month ago. I'm actually testifying at the um, Health and Human Services tomorrow around a bill that's coming about around birth control um, and requiring secondary schools to have it available, a free available to, to students. Um, so I'm testifying on that tomorrow. Um, we don't have currently contraception available for students in our building. Um, so that would, might be something this board wants to take up or wait until to see what the HHS decides on this, on this yeah, legislation, be. which might be smart because it's coming your way anyway. Well, and I mean, because I, I, I get the sense too that uh, the, the quality is as big and not a bigger issue than the, the quantity, the, the time we spend mm -hmm. on yep. it. And also, you know, you know, kind of going to reading and literature and to you know, science and other things, you know, a lot of those subjects touch on these issues in various ways. I mean, I wonder if there's a way to, you know, there, there are certain books you read that have themes that touch on, you know, sexuality and health and alcoholism and, um, you know, not that every teacher needs to be prepared for that, but, you know, looking for those opportunities to discuss tough issues outside of a health class. And some teachers would tell you they don't Absolutely. have the training to discuss that. I think that might be correct, but... But I think they do. It's just not perceived as health instruction yeah. by the community or students, necessarily. Yeah. Like they read Speak in ninth grade, which is a book that um, talks about sexual assault. So they talk about that. Yeah. Although when my daughter was in ninth grade, the boys were given the option to read a different book. <laughs> Well, I mean, those are, the, those are the type of things that... Hopefully that's no longer yeah. happening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in, I think in fairness to you, too, I, don't, I heard two, two areas of concern. One is, you know, how much of the day do we want it to take? But the other is just that there's a lot of curriculum that needs to be worked on right now. So yeah. in terms of squeezing other things out, it's, a matter, it's not the curriculum itself. It's the development of the curriculum that's squeezing things out right now. And... That makes sense, right? It's like, well, what about reading? Shouldn't we be working on that at the same same speed? So I, I'm not trying to be critical at all. I know you're balancing. I'm just saying, I just want to make sure we all are heard around, and I know we are, is that the community is like screaming for this, right? And it's qual. I think quality, I think they, they got it right. It's not time, it's quality. So. But another thing that Libby did just say, and I do not envy your position on this, is she's hearing from parents on uh, polar opposite ends of the spectrum, and whether it's evidence-based or not, sentiments are very strong on both sides um, of this, and Libby's in the middle, just, you know. Yeah, it's hard. Good luck, Libby. Thanks. Yes. Okay. <laughs> tell me where I, I you know, help me understand. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, beyond us just wishing you well, I, I, I think I have said this before on this topic, and I would say again, we often tap the reserve fund for one-time expenses related to buildings, but there's no reason that we can't tap our reserves for one-time expenses related to curriculum development. So I feel like yes. if there are, we can't clone Mike, but if there are resources that could be brought to bear to help the crunch on curriculum development, I would want to hear that that need existed. If a consultant, a way to or maybe yeah. some work. Right, yeah, that, and that's yeah. my end, it's just getting the right people at the table. Wish you luck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would support that too. Well, not that I'm relevant anymore, but right. a consultant. Well, you're, about, you're relevant right now. <laughs> For the next a couple time. weeks from now, <laughs> not so much. <laughs> the next time this comes up. Um, so, uh, back to the cafeteria for just a second. There must be um, schools that have 
solved this or been done creative things about it that have models you know yeah, the cafeteria thing as Eve alluded to, there was, um, Renee had a bit of an email snafu. Yes. <laughs> she probably know. Um, and that, the while well, that was a mistake um, that we I won't really get into right now, uh, the, the sentiments that she learned from it were really important. And yes. what, what Eve is bringing to the table here is what um, we learned, she learned from it, right? So she's well into how do we solve this problem right now? Like, how, what do we need to do to solve this problem? Um, and she's not backing down from it. It's, it's almost, it's not to say like we we're ignorant of it, but it really came to head when, um, when she sent an email that she didn't mean to send. <laughs> um, and that, that was a, that's a good thing. This, yeah. The fact that this conversation, it's uncomfortable, but it's a good thing that, that we're gonna start having it. Uh, but, but literally that happened, what, Thursday of last week, Friday of last week, so it's new. It's yeah. new. We kind of hijacked the learning focus. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if hijack is the right term. But you can interest. We jumped off of it. Yeah. You know? Exactly. We responded exactly. fully. We were yeah. very interested in Do you have more, though, that, that well, we kind of went off there? No, that, that's just <laughs> Well, I mean, these are definitely some common themes that we're, you know, struggling with. We're glad that, that the administration is paying attention to them. Mm -hmm. um, and we understand the community challenges associated with it. Um, and, you know, the other challenges, too. We're leaning into the health stuff, the health curriculum now. You just, you can't do that fast. You, you have to build a coalition around yeah. it. You got to take your mm -hmm. time. You got to do it right, or else it's going to be done wrong. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and you'll never do it in a way that will satisfy every right. last right. community member. Right. He's got the right people on the team. He's got really concerned people on the team. So we'll do a good job with it. Excellent. Uh, are we ready to move to, um, to Becca and pre K and X66? Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Can I introduce you? Yes. You can. You can introduce yourself. <laughs> I was going to say, hopefully, I'm less controversial. <laughs> so this is Becca. And she is our regional coordinator with Winooski Valley. So we were, prior to me, we were one of the very smart places in the state that um, when Act 166 came, the superintendents of the Winooski Valley said, we don't think we can handle this on our own. And if we're going to be sharing kids across districts at the preschool level, we need to have a common coordinator. So each of us pay a little bit of, of Becca's salary. She I own pay 11. <laughs> yeah, she lives in Barrie, or well, not lives. She lives in Burlington, but her office is under, uh, is a Harry Potter cupboard under the stairs in Barrie um, with John Pandolfo. Um, so welcome, Becca. Thank you for coming. And I have to say, because I, I learned today that the Winooski Valley doesn't have anything to do with Winooski. Mm -hmm. It happens to be made up of the school districts around here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, the Winooski River. It's the Winooski River. 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 doesn't correspond to the river either. <laughs> and, and to further, um, to further, you know, kind of confuse the issue, um, what I've learned, so I'm a, I'm a new employee. Um, so my background is um, I've been an early childhood special educator and then I went off and did a whole bunch of really consulting and professional development, um, working with providers, so working with people who work in child cares. Um, did a lot on developmental screenings, did a lot on systems work, graduated from ECLI, um, so did the spelling system um, for early childhood. Um, so I'm relatively new to the team. I started um, the day that the big kids went back to school in August. Um, so a few months into, into it. The piece that really confuses the situation, um, this is not gonna click for me. The piece that really confuses the situation is that Winooski Valley Superintendents Association only exists when the people who are, when the superintendents who are in the association are talking about it. It's not a standalone legal entity. It's a group of people who talk about it because we need a shorthand conversation. Um, so Libby was so kind as to, one, issue the invitation with you all, um, but also kind of give me some talking points in terms of information that you may or may not know about um, Act 166 that you may or may not know about 
preschoolers um, in the WVSA uh, and within the Winooski Valley um, Superintendents Association. So um, you do have, there's a couple slides that are hard to read with the numbers and everything and I didn't know what people would walk away with. Um, and as Libby can attest, I'm one of these people who's not shy about saying like, I have no idea, let me get back to you um, and following up with you. So feel free to jump in and ask any questions. Um, I did put my, um, where you can find me, Harry Potter under the stairs, I love that. <laughs> um, all my contact information's on the front of the presentation, so feel free to reach out. Um, I'm pretty consistently reachable. So um, the Act 166 education law is the universal preschool law in Vermont. Um, it basically funds any child who's three, four, or five, which is a little quirky, we'll talk about that, um, by the kindergarten cutoff, so by September 1st, um, to fund up to, well, to fund 10 hours of preschool in a 35-week period. Uh, it's paid for through the ADM money um, and kind of divvied up by the school districts, which either pays for your in-house program, it pays for a Montpelier student who might go to um, a you know, public school in Waterbury, or it pays for preschoolers who are residents of this area who attend childcare anywhere in the state. So it's kind of this, like, I say that I wrestle octopuses all, all day. Um, and parents have that choice, so parents can choose which of those options they want to do. So the agency that has really defined pre-kindergarten, uh, there is a pre-qualified program that uh, pre-qualification process that all of the providers, school-based, home-based, child care center-based um, have to go through. There's an enormous list of things that the AOE says, you know, you have to have a licensed teacher on site or if you're a home-based program consulting to you. If you're a school-based uh, program, the teacher has to be in the classroom during those instructional hours. Uh, there's definitions around funding. The AOE is constantly sending out kind of clarification um, memos and, and pieces. A couple have come out this week. Uh, but they really start from the premise that what we're trying to do with this law is really increase high quality education. So really thinking about their, def their definition is really high quality and effective instruction, licensed educators, which is key, um, using evidence-based practices, intentionally designed, aligning the curriculum with their early learning standards, um, and really this piece about inclusion and access. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, the early learning standards are a continuation um, or the start to um, the grade level expectations and learning standards that we talk about it at the upper ages. Does that make sense kind of as a where we are placing us? There's about 659 kids um, throughout the Winnipeg Valley region who are tuitioned outside of their home district school-based preschool program. I have a quick question for you. Yeah. Where do they, where does AOE define this? Is it in the rule that they define that or is it? It is, I don't know if it's actually in the legislative law, it's on their website. Okay. Um, and it's on all of the taglines that they send to everybody. Okay. So it's fairly well publicized and out there. I don't know if it's actually in the legislation. It might be in the, um, there's currently legislation that's in process. Um, the last one I read was the beginning of last week. It might be re-updated into there as well. Do you know what that bill is off the top of your head? I can look it up for you. Okay, I'm just wondering. Yeah, I can send the, um, I can send the link to, to Libby to distribute. Thank you. Um, it's pretty constantly updated. Um, there was uh, some testimony today. I know there's a full slate tomorrow. Um, and it's really looking at, um, and we'll get into this a little bit more, but it's looking at the fact that the study, so the AOE said, let's do this thing, the legislature went for it, we've got this whole system in place. Um, there was just a report published by an outside organization um, that does research 
uh, and it was just published in January looking at the 2017-18, so a few years into it, so like two or three years into the law, they were reflectively looking at whether it was working or not, so now there's all this traction and speed because we have the results of this research from an outside Vermont organization. Um, so here's a pretty picture of where we are for the um, Winooski Valley. Um, so Lamoille South, Lamoille North, Orleans Central, Orange, um, Us, Barry, um, White River Valley. Uh, what's not on this map, because this is the map that I have them in central Vermont. Um, what's not on this map, because this is my like already thinking of moving our publicity stuff towards 2021, uh, Twinfield and Cabot school districts have been with us for this year. Uh, this was their transition year, so they're going back to Caledonia with the rest of, of kind of that reconfigured school district. Um, but they've been with us for this year. So um, I do lots and lots and lots of things, um, <laughs> but this is the like, you know, when you look at, you know, the job description, this pretty much sums it up. Um, what I really do is I act as the liaison between whoever's providing the preschool services and the school district folks. So every school district, every supervisor union, um, all 11 of them have somebody whose job it is to coordinate the local level. So Tracy Locke is the person for Montpelier Roxbury. Uh, so she's the person who, if a parent brings a question to Montpelier, she kind of front lines it and then moves it, you know, kind of either to Libby or to finance or to me and, and hits it that way. We also coordinate on the paperwork. Um, it's my job to make sure that whoever's providing the, the 10 hours a week of public pre-K has their insurance and their licensed teacher and I go out and I visit them and I do some you know, on-site and off-site monitoring. I make sure that you know, there's policies they're giving to parents. If a parent's unhappy, it usually comes to me first. Um, and then really in terms of designing um, the publicity pieces, the programs all enter a contract. We just got it back from the lawyer. Superintendents are going to talk about it on Friday. So really that sort of stuff is all wrapped into what I do. Can I ask yeah. you, I, I think I might be missing a piece. Oh, no, Why does this, if the, if they're really, the districts are a funding district for the positions of coordination, right? Correct. They're not really, there's no boundaries within the state in terms of, of the mobility of families to put their kids wherever. Um, there is, but they're going away under the new proposed. Okay. Okay. So right now, and I think it's only one. Yeah. So, so the law affects every preschooler in the state. Yeah. Um, within our group of 11, who holds that local district person position is the curriculum director or the special ed director or um, sometimes the principal. Um, so it really varies who that person is. So the idea of my position is really that I have the time to do this. Um, the school districts can apply under current regs, can apply to the AOE in order to say, we don't really want to pay outside our boundaries. Um, as far as I know, right. the only one is the like Rutland corridor. Right. Right. Um, and in the new bill proposal, that's a like, we're done with that. Right. Um, right. Because the districts were able to make those decisions on their own originally. Initially. Initially. Yeah. I remember that. OK. So then I guess the last question of that yeah. is. No, that's good. Does there need to be local? people in your position. Why, what is it, why not have the AOE do this? In other words, I'm not trying to, I'm not, I swear I'm not trying to eliminate a cost. Well, that is the cunning thing you've ever said. No, I, I, I'm, I just don't understand why, why this needs to be organized locally, not necessarily even regionally, right. but why does every school need to field these questions if it's a statewide system? Right. So, when, so I think a couple, and those are that like, yes, come testify. Not that I, <laughs> not that I don't want my job. I'm very happy right, with right. my job. Um, so 
I think there's a couple of pieces to it, right? So in terms of local people and my position, I definitely, we need, we need to have people within the district who are identified as the people who kind of like, because the, the kids all register as Montpelier Roxbury School District students. So I get their names, but I don't do that stack of registration paperwork or move that or put it in Power School or in SIS or any of that stuff. In terms of the state, I think the, 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 the piece to introduce into the conversation before we talk about capacity, the piece to introduce into the conversation is that for preschool age children, not preschool, including preschool, but not just preschool, for children who have not yet reached school age, who are in this kind of you know, quasi land before we get them in kindergarten, they have to work under the child care licensing regs, which is the agency of human services. For programs who are providing public pre -K, public pre -K, universal preschool in this funding model, they also have to straddle the agency of ed. So right now, they have to follow both sets of regs. That's your next slide. Is it? <laughs> there we go. Um, <clears throat> So, which is which is a challenge, and which is addressed in the new bill that I'll that I'll get you the link for. So, there's this piece of two ownerships. There's only about five people in the early ed department in the agency of ed, and so, regardless of this particular program, there's not a stable enough workforce and there's not the number of people they don't they don't have the capacity in the new proposal the um, the proposal that's out there for the bill is really looking at would we kind of somebody on the I had a call with all the local district people today and somebody said well you know in the divorce um, so in, in the bill there would be a division um, of of kind of this dual oversight um, and right now the proposed bill um, has the agency event taking that role um, and has in it the structure that they would increase the monitoring they would increase like all of those pieces we just talked about about what I do is in that proposal well isn't another big thing that it's not mandatory Right. You don't have I can to go to three parent, I can choose as a parent to send my Which is different than everything else the AOE takes care of. Exactly. Well, and I think, you know, part of the conversation that those of us who who's you know, who live and breathe um, early ed is, you know, the 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 dual oversight is a problem, but agency of health and service of human services is, are really the people who are so used to looking at all of those other pieces around care of young kids, right? You get a three-year-old who goes to Union Elementary's preschool program, and they're, I mean, kindergartners are still babies, but like they're not the first grader who walks in who can be independent that, you know, kind of that same piece we were talking about, about different developmental needs at, at each level. Um, so there's a lot of, a lot of conversation. Um, does that? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I might, that's an efficiency, but I was looking at why does each district need this, but I get it. I mean, they're registered at the district level, right. so they're, they're students of the district. Right. There's some ownership of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Local control, Steve. What's that? Local control. <laughs> Well, it's a funding mechanism too, the way it flows through too. So that's the other piece of it. It's a funding mechanism. We get, we get local control. Yes, right. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. 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 It comes through the school district. Right. Yeah. Um, and you don't have a choice as a school district about participating in it sure. or not. Yeah. You have a choice about do you want to run your own program? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, and so you know, kind of, kind of as a as an interesting piece, the um, 
the Waterbury Stowe Morrisville is our biggest kind of line of number of students. Um, but the greatest number in the WVSA, the greatest number of providers are actually up in Chittenden County. Um, so that question that you were asking about, like the like the do we know why, um, is really around parent workforce. Yeah. Um, and also about the fact that Roxbury doesn't have any community programs that are eligible, right? And Montpelier has you know, many more than many other places, but it's also a, a, a piece. Um, so another challenge to implementing is that um, this is comes through as a local funding mechanism, but it's funded differently and separately from special ed services. So if you have a student who lives in Roxbury who receives special ed services, it doesn't it doesn't have to cross the special ed services don't have to cross the the um, district line. So when you think about like how am I funding this? Um, what we know from the, um, the report that was just done, the study that was just done, um, is that most children with special ed services actually are enrolled in their home district's school-based preschool program. Um, and then there's you know, always the question of parents um, refusing services. Um, we know that low community program numbers, so are there availability of spaces that are Act 166 qualified, um, that if we don't have those program numbers, that's why we, that's when we tend to see more public pre-K, publicly housed pre-K. Um, and then licensed teachers is always an issue. Um, so the WVSA does not issue provisional licenses based on a whole lot of pieces, including the fact that like Libby's not gonna sign off on one and go to Chittenden County and supervise a teacher in a preschool classroom. Um, so, you know, and that's, that's the reality across the state. It's a reality in terms of the messaging that's out there for, you know, private preschool programs, child cares um, are, you know, in desperate need of having teachers um, who are qualified, who are licensed, but we have three school district programs that are you know, on a shoestring right now and trying to cover maternity leaves and don't have licensed teachers within those programs. Um, so it's not just a community-based problem, it's a, it's a school problem as well, as I'm sure you guys see at the other ages. Um, but that's also a, a huge, um, that's a huge reason why we don't have more community programs that are pre-qualified and can do Act 166. So provisional are not allowed, or is it that they're we, not required? We uh, they they need to be either they need to have on their teacher's license and endorsement in early childhood or early childhood special ed. We as a WVSA super they as a WVSA superintendents group um, because of the method of like who do you choose and how do you supervise them um, doesn't sign off. As the, as the signing off body on provisional licenses. But so if we had a problem in our program, in-house program, could we have a provisional? Oh no, yeah, in-house no, is yeah. different than, than out-of-house. Okay. In-house we get provisionals all the, all the time. So that we can supervise. Yeah, them. absolutely, right. but okay. the challenge becomes, if I'm not gonna sign off on a provisional for somebody who doesn't work for us. No, right. Because right. It's, they're basically working under my license. Yeah. And it's not, and it's not a living thing. It's a like, it's no, I get it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, this this was an issue we had at the very beginning yes. of this because we yeah. were asked to take on provisional licenses, and there's no reasonable way for our superintendent to supervise, supervise. and evaluate and mm -hmm. so forth in a program well, we have no control yeah. over. Yeah. Yeah. Right. In effect. Right. Right. Um, and the AOE has just, um, the AOE just put out the, based off of the testimony that they just did, they just put out the new numbering system. Um, so hopefully there will be some AOE pieces. Right now, if I hear about, you know, if I hear through the grapevine or if I happen to stop in and there's an issue, that's the monitoring that takes place. There's not. Just like Libby's not in every program, I'm not in every program every day. Uh, we have about 60 partner programs, um, both you know, your kind of home-based, the school-based, and the center-based. Um, so just a quick um, thought on that free and reduced lunch, who's accessing the program. Um, I 
Got these numbers from Tracy who talked to the local people. So um, at Union, there are two three-year-olds and seven four-year-olds in the program who are the um, who are receiving free and reduced lunch, who are eligible for free and reduced lunch. Um, and in Roxbury, there's one four-year-old. Um, and those numbers pretty much are balanced in terms of actual student enrollment in those classes. Um, the Union Elementary's in-house uh, has 15 students in the AM and 15 in the PM. Um, and the morning program is a collaborative between Head Start um, and the SU. Um, and Morgan is, is owned by Montpelier Roxbury School mm -hmm. District. Um, she's a school district employee. Um, and that was based on the Head Start couldn't find mm -hmm. a qualified teacher. Um, so Morgan and Brenda te could teach those two classrooms. And then Roxbury Village, Dottie has 17 students that are um, enrolled within that program. So those are your in-house um, public preschool based numbers. Um, and then I'll talk about the community in just a minute, but just a quick note on that special ed to go back to those challenges. Um, Montpelier, um, Brenda gave me these numbers. Um, there are three or four children, both in the morning and afternoon classes. So combined, they average three in, they average three in one program and four in the other, um, who are solidly on IEPs and receiving special ed services within that program in their regular classroom at this point in time. Um, there are five children who are Montpelier Roxbury uh, residents who receive services in their in-district boundary um, Montpelier preschool programs. So does that make sense? So like over at Montpelier Children's House or over at Montessori because they're in the district boundaries. Um, four kiddos in those community um, care and education programs are currently being evaluated. So that also boosts your numbers, um, but also talks to the really great collaboration that the public school and the programs, especially in this area, have going on. Um, and one child is served um, as home-based services um, on an IEP. And in Roxbury, there's one student who's currently going through the eval, the eval process. So again, you know, those numbers kind of line up with where our kids who are receiving services. Um, just a, a key piece about Roxbury, um, there are nine preschool age, and I got these numbers from, um, from Let's Grow Kids, so there are nine preschool age spaces um, at Kangaroo care, Kids Care, um, and then Linda is a home-based child care. Neither of those programs are um, AOE pre-qualified programs to provide this Act 166 service. Um, so they're not, um, those nine slots plus um, Linda's, depending how our numbers are, um, are not public pre-K, universal pre-K um, funded slots. And are those really available probably. slots or filled slots? I don't know if they're available or filled, but they don't meet the pre-qualification. Okay. Um, because they don't have a certified teacher? Uh, because they haven't gone, they haven't met all of the criteria. I honestly am don't not know familiar it. with this program. Okay. I don't know, like, do they not have a teacher? Do they have licensing violations? Um, I do know that the data I got from Let's Grow Kids, um, Linda only has one star, and you have to have three stars in order to even enter the process. So I do know that that's the piece around around her program. There's a lot of building requirements are to you, you yes. have to meet. Yeah. Are you just talking, this is the universe of what's available? This is the universe of what's available. So in Roxbury, you have nine spaces that are for three, four, and five-year-olds, and then you know, whatever Linda's kind of home-based right. care, so right? So figure 10 total or whatever. Right. 10 total that are not eligible to even talk to me about forming a, a partnership. And zero that are eligible. And zero who are eligible, okay. so well, the public you have the public program. program. Of course, yeah. And, and the 17 in the public yeah. program. Um, so in Roxbury, I did, and I'm totally understanding, I'm from Burlington, so like the whole geography thing is a little mucky to me. I get the 10 miles is not could be a really easy drivable distance and could not be depending where you were talking about. Um, but if I go into the child care registry and do Roxbury, 
pre-qualified programs 10 miles as my filters. Um, there are 13 programs, only one is pre-qualified. Um, it's Spring Hill School and it's in Waitsfield. Um, and Kira, I talked to her on Monday. Um, she has 27 slots, they're full. She anticipates that they're already full for next year. So that just kind of gives you a, a kind of lay of the land. Um, Libby had said like, is there a lay of the land we can give them for child care capacity, Act 166 capacity? Good. Does that make yeah. sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I did the same, um, and here are the school-based programs um, that are within 10 mile radius. So anyone but within 10 miles of Roxbury can go to these. Um, the um, Braintree and Brookfield school-based programs are not through their Act 166 pre-qualification yet. We're working on it next week. Um, so those are not listed, but probably would be available for next year as well. Um, so these are the public preschool. And remember that anybody in the state can go to any of these. So can Roxbury Preschool kids come to Montpelier mm -hmm. public program? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they can go anywhere in the... Um, do we, can we establish geography preferences? How do you do that? You can't establish, you can for special... For special ed, you can't for Act 166. So how, are, you how can, do you deal with too much demand? You can choose to serve your home kids first. Okay. Um, so so you, you can say Union Elementary has capacity for 30 kids. We are only going to serve residents of our district. So that would include Montpelier and Roxbury, right? We're only going to serve these kids were not accepting outside tuition and you can do that but you can't beyond that you, you can't, can't be them. you can't say our Montpelier kids can only go in this geographic well, but can we kids. say you know we have 30 positions or yeah. and we'll take you know and and we 20 have 25 are kids are okay you can do that yes, okay you can do that. Yeah. And do that do any of these have excess capacity more demand, I suppose. Yeah, we have a lottery yeah. to get in because we have more kids that want right. in. Right. right. I'm right. just wondering, does, does anybody have access to demand in the public? Um, no. no. Okay. <laughs> access, <laughs> access, access supply. supply. Sorry. Access supply. Access supply. Access supply. Yeah. Um, no. no. Okay. Yeah. There, um, you know, I can tell you from experience because I sit in my, my little cubby hole, um, the Barry person sits with me. Um, Barry City is over capacity in terms of kids at that pre-K. Barry Town is looking like they're gonna have like three spaces um, that we know aren't full for next year. Um, but that probably doesn't mean that they're actually available. Um, there are 59, I ran the same filters, there are 59 programs for Montpelier. Um, eight are pre-qualified. Uh, we work with all eight of those programs. They have active um, partnership projects with us. Um, one program is religious and it's not eligible for Act 166 tuition because it's public school funding. Um, so a program that's affiliated with the Catholic schools is not eligible to receive the tuition. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And there are your... Um, and again, to rehash the, the pre-qualified programs, what differentiates the pre-qualified from the non-pre-qualified programs again? So pre-qualified programs have to go through, um, the AOE has a pre-qualified system. Okay. So it's basically um, that you're using teaching strategies gold, so you're using the assessment tool that we require. Your, uh, you have a licensed teacher and the, like, the variation of like what does that mean for a requirement differs on what type of program it is, but you have a licensed teacher. Um, there's some pieces around like your handbook has to have, you know, kind of the inclusion, the, you know, not refusal. You have to agree to work with your public school. Are there any financial differ differences between pre-qualified and, and non-pre-qualified? There are schools. some building requirements. And are there any? If, there, any legal, there are. Like, uh, for example, is there a cost difference um, or a funding difference? Like, if we have more kids going to pre qualified 
Oh, kids can, kids can only go to pre-qualified with their, their, with their tuition. Okay. So, so, my, so my kid okay, can only go to a pre-qualified program if I want to ask for the money from the school district. If I just want to send my child because it's a voluntary program, I can go wherever I want. Okay. But you don't get the money. But you don't get the money. So, the, but so if all the pre-qualified, if all the pre-qualified supply is full, then is there any mechanism to provide families with money or no? No. So the money travels with the child. So if a child starts in this location and moves to this location, any tuition that they haven't attended for yet goes to that new place. Um, it's a set amount I've been working on next year, so I apologize, I don't have off the tip of my tongue this year. Next year it's 3,445. Um, and so, Parents and get that chunk of chunk of money spread out. The school districts all pay invoices on a monthly basis, um, and the WVSA does it on a reimbursement system. Um, the programs, the school districts up north of us, all prepay the programs and then kind of figure it out and rebalance throughout the year. The WVSA school districts, so this piece, um, all say. Okay, you were enrolled by September 4th. You're billing me for the, you know, services and weeks the kids attended from September 4th to, you know, October 1st. We'll pay you back for that expense. Um, the law says the tuition has to be spent directly with for the child, and it it has to. It's not Montpelier writing a check to the family, but it's Montpelier writing a check to the program who has to apply all of it to the education. That doesn't mean that the $98.43 that the program is getting for that kid for their 10 hours is anywhere near the cost of 10 hours of early care and education. So programs still set their own prices, but it's a huge help. Does that, did I just muddle the issue or did you a get it? A little bit, but I'll, I can follow up. Money goes with the kid. Money goes with the kid, but only if they go to pre-qualified programs. Exactly. And the pre-qualified programs are all full, so. They're not all full, necessarily. They're, They're not, not all full, full, necessarily. The public ones are. The public, yeah. the the public, public ones, ones are. I would, I would say, you know, this is part of the child care crunch. Like, this is the effect that, as a school district, we feel when you hear all of those conversations about, like, talk to your legislators. There's not enough child care. This is part of it. Um, so there, there is space. Um, there is space in some of the school-based programs. I think if you if you were to look at a list of what we have for public um, programs, and you think about the amount of young children that you have in an area, you know. I, I have one question. Yeah. No, go for it. Um, way back on free and reduced lunch, too. Yeah. Um, we you had nine kids, which if we had two of our grade level classes, that would be 160 kids, and nine out of 160 is only 5%. So that doesn't correlate at all with our free and reduced lunch population. Our preschool program is smaller, though. It's not as big as our typical grade level. OK. This is so this is nine program. kids it's out only of a third quarter, right? So this is your school base. So it's a third, almost. Yeah. So one of the holes in the data. Our... So well, you yeah. Like 15%. Well, if it's nine out of thirty, yeah. it's almost okay. a third of it. So our our free reduces. So that does align. Yeah. Right. Well, it's I it's was, higher. I was wondering if it's higher than to do something, but yeah, it's higher than yeah. And and there's holes in the collection of data. We don't have a really some districts within the WVSA, some districts not. Mm -hmm. um, collect the free and reduced lunch forms and some don't so we don't actually know like i don't know what those nine is out of you know how many free and reduced there really are that question is oh, specifically in the community right because right. Right. it it's not necessarily a data point that they collect right um so we're working on like so, that's that's one of those pieces that i want to i, I have another question so on sure. the funding so my understanding um, is that the, uh, what is the Waitsfield School District called? Waits Harwood Union. It's Harwood, thank you, Harwood Union. You're welcome. My understanding is they're able, they have a pretty robust pre-K program, a public pre-K program. The, they have public 
publicly housed pre-K programs. That's always the language, right? Because it's all public pre-K, but it's not public pre-K in the conversation we're having. Um, they have Act 166 school-based programs in all of their like elementary schools. So you're looking at one location, whereas they have multiple locations. There's two. Two yeah, locations. Five you have two, mm -hmm. right. And, but they have, they, they have, my understanding is they're doing a pretty good job of meeting the demand. They're, they're doing a pretty good job. I want, don't quote me on this number, but I was doing the like, how much people are gonna pay towards this for next year. I was doing that today. Um, they have, I don't know how many they have in-house, but they also have 116-ish kids. That number's like sticking in my mind. Um, that they tuition out to other places. Um, so I think they have high capacity, good system, um, and I mean, to some extent, really savvy, educated parents as well. Um, and, a, and a force where a large percentage of their kids are enrolled out of district for pre community child care. So here's the other thing to consider, remember, we're the anomaly about growing population of kids. In other districts that population has dropped, they've got the room. If we wanted to run another preschool, we don't have any place to put it. In, physically in the building. In the right. building. So that's why some districts have more room to run more preschools because they have the room to put them in. Barry School District has 127 kids in house, um, but they run the equivalent of eight preschool classrooms. Yeah. Right? They run they they have two schools, they run four classrooms twice at like twice a day times two. Um, but they have a huge number of kids and you know Lauren's like we can't steal any more room from them. like right. they are capped out they're just capped out at a different number than you are right. in terms of space and we have how many 30, 30. 30. 15 at a time we have 30 you, spaces you have, but you have 15 in your morning monthly program 15 in your afternoon program and 17 in Roxbury but I think Roxbury's program can a little bit but, more than but that. we have Montpelier kids that are going to the other. You have, program. right. Do we know how many we have total for Montpelier? I can pull that number for you. And Roxbury. Yeah. You mean going That's to it. private? Total, yeah, total private. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. 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 we have a lot of choices that are yeah. pre approved. And I, and I have that number. I can pull it for you. That's, a, that's an easy number. The public is just, it's just a right. very small part of meeting the demand, but it's really important for the special education too, especially. Yeah. Well, and it's and it's important to have the balancing classrooms, right? We don't want those eight, nine kids on IEPs to like we don't want our, our publicly based preschools to be the default just, yeah. for the children who are lower income and receiving special and or receiving special ed services. Um, so I just want to get through two more slides and then I could stand here and talk about this all night because I'm so passionate about it, but I also, I want to recognize things. Um, so there's a couple ways that we know if this is working or not. Um, I did a family survey um, that I sent out. Um, the quick, down and dirty, because you can read the slides I put them in. The quick, down and dirty is that it was sent out to somewhere between 800 and 900 um, families. It was sent out via SurveyMonkey. Um, some school districts, yours included, chose to send them to your in-house kids. Um, the, some of our um, WBSA school districts didn't send them to in-house programs. Um, we, as far as the WBSA, got about 450, got 450, it's not an about, got 450 responses. Wow. Um, which, like, <laughs> I walked into John's office and I was like, oh my God, and he goes, I'm watching the emails fly in because it's his account, right? So he gets the updates. Um, 450 was huge. It was a 14 question um, survey. It went out via survey monkey. And then um, programs, if they asked, I sent them the paper copies and they sent them back to me and I entered them. Um, the overall response is that people are really happy with this program. They want longer hours. They want more support financially. Um, and then the kind of identified, like, was it easy to register my kid? Because they have to register with you 
and enroll somewhere else, right? So unless they're in a school district program, you get all the registration paperwork. They do all the enrollment with their program. Um, so the, the quirkiness around that is something that the school district individual 11 people and I are working on and have spent months um, putting into practice heading into next year. So we'll see how that goes. Um, quick down and dirty on the teaching strategies. So at its most basic level, when the legislation initially went in, the legislature said we need to have beginning and end data because we don't know if this works. We don't know if um, preschool works, um, which of course, like all us early ed people were like, well, of course it works, kids develop. Um, but this is how we're measuring this. Um, it looks at 38 different learning standards and objectives, um, and so the, um, the children's skills are scored on a continuum. Um, next year when you invite me back, I'll be able to give you some real data. The data right now is you can't compare this year's fall to last year's fall because of the amount of school districts that changed and the towns that changed within them. It's really mucky data, um, and I question its validity. Um, but I have it if anybody really wants to talk to me about it. Um, and then the kindergarten um, readiness surveys. So I just threw up here kind of some of the um, who responded. There were 72 respondents from Montpelier. Um, so there's an idea on your ages. Um, people are mostly finding out from your website. This is Montpelier data. This is not WVSA data um, from your website. Um, and then, you know, kind of in decreasing, it's that community networking um, and then their community programs. Poor little AOE website had one. Um, this is. <laughs> you can't find anything on it. <laughs> it's like the worst website ever. <laughs> I, I do the link all the time because I'm like, I have no idea where to find stuff. Um, and then, you know, I think this is pretty substantial that out of 72, we've got 35 who agree that this process um, was easy um, and strongly agree. Um, and then I just got, I pulled out, these are regional, I didn't have a way of sorting it to be like, the Montpelier people are saying this. Um, but this is kind of, these are thematic around the, the piece. Um, so I just pulled some of those out for you. And like I said, I am so passionate about this, I've probably talked way more than you wanted me to, and I'm so sorry. But questions? <laughs> Any, surpri any before? surprises in the, in the data? In the, in the data from the family survey? Yeah. Not really. Um, the, the pieces that came up were really in line with the challenges um, that are coming up in all the studies, they're coming up in those conversations with people. Um, and then the other, you know, the other pieces around the data in terms of kind of what people are thinking and wanna see are, are really particularly around registration. Um, it is so complex, I don't have kids, but it's so complex to think about the fact that like your three-year-old, you know, in March now, when they turn three in July, you're already starting to talk about school registration, but they're staying in their same childcare program. So it's like, it's very odd as a family to, to do that process. Um, it's cumbersome. Like I said, we've been working really hard, this team of 11 and I, for the last, like this has been my push, is if we want to give high quality childcare to kids, we need, we need to make it as easy as possible for people who truly care about their kids, like you care where your kid is, you care about the people who you know educate your kid, but it's only the one little piece that Jim was talking about about your life, right? Um, so we've been doing a lot of work around simplifying processes and getting standardization between the 11 of the districts. What's the state doing to get more certified preschool teachers? Um, they, as terms of AOE and state, um, don't seem to have any initiatives they're putting out there. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is an issue? Um, Let's Grow Kids and um, the uh, Vermont group of the, the National um, Organization for the Education of Young Children, Association for the Education of Young Children, 
are working together and working with VSAC, and both in terms of grants and VSAC funding, are really pouring as much energy and money into it. But you've still got you know the 20 year old with no degree who wants to do this, but she's got a child at home and she's working full time because she needs to work um, and can't go to school and balance it. And then you add in the cost of school. Um, so there's a lot of like really everybody recognizes the problem, um, but pouring money in it isn't going to solve the situation either. Um, so I'll get the bill. Um, is it the one that was introduced last year? They've made, uh, they introduced it last year, had some motion on it. Um, we thought that they were going to start from what they were working on, um, but they actually revamped it. Um, and so it's a new bill that has many, many iterations. Um, the last one that I saw was the 12th of February. Um, so I'll email you the bill and you can disseminate it. Um, I get you the. What, we wanted to know the number of tuition for Montpelier students. I think it would be helpful to know the total number of pre-K uh, students that we have going to pre-qualified. Okay. Um, that isn't Montpelier. I'm also, I'm really curious to know for our lottery, what are the total number? We have 30 open spots, but. Actually, Grant would know that too. He pays the bill. Right? How many people are trying to get in? Yeah, How, How many, many people, people want to get in? I, I mean, anecdotally, part of I, I had inquired with Libby a couple of times about pre-K stuff. This is generally to the board, because I live in a community of uh, young uh, families, and I'm of an age where I have a lot of friends who have young families. And one thing I hear from them, pri the primary thing I hear from them when they're like, oh yeah, you're on the school board, like, do you think we could expand our pre-K offerings? And I'm like, I don't know anything about our pre-K <laughs> offerings. So, um, well, now you do, and you can yeah. say, I but well, no, it's she, good. Just she rocked it, yeah, so yeah, yeah. I know who to ask the questions to. <laughs> the answer is no, because we don't have space. You yeah. can't expand because we don't have space for it. We'd have to build a new building. Or, you know, rent some space from DCFA who might be interested. But you have to have, Tina's right, there's yeah, significant there's building requirements because of the HSF. <laughs> yeah, it's a high entry cost. Uh, it's we, a, we had to redo the oh rooms God, yeah. at Union so that they could pre preschool rooms. Yeah. There's a lot of requirements. It was a project just to be able to do that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, and, and it it's really anywhere. this developmental age thing where it's, it's not the first grade that I can, you know, and totally like, I know, I know it's You're not showing as your easy. Bias. My background is elementary <laughs> ed, but, but it's, it's not as easy as we have books, we have students, we have a teacher, we have tables, yeah. right? I mean, those kids have to wash their hands when they enter. They have to wash their hands after they use the bathroom. They have to the wash their hands before, you know, before snack. They have to wash their hands and whenever so they touch the tiny pad, tiny. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. And, and they're little, right? Um, so there's, and they there's, run there's off huge and, yeah. infrastructure cost to it. And what do you know what pre-K educators get paid compared to? <laughs> depends where you are. Well. Depends which program they're in. Yeah. So it depends which program they're in. They're um, paid in the public. Yeah, they, they're under the teacher contract. They are, they are better paid in the public schools because they're on a teacher's contract, but it also, like, you also get benefits and vacation and health and dental and retirement, like you're a teacher contract package. Um, I was paying, as a, as a director of the Y, I was paying my licensed teachers $17 an hour. With you pay me back $3,000 for benefits, there's no retirement fund. Um, and guess what, here's your stack of personal days. You can use them or not use them, but it's your sick time, it's your vacation, it's your personal time. Which is less than um, the so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and yeah. Head Start doesn't pay, I mean, Head Start pays along those lines, but yeah, the, the, they're probably bringing down somewhere between 20 and like 25,000. Um, it's miserable. Um, and you know, we have to be really careful about the conversation that we need to increase for everybody, there's nobody new coming into the field. Um, I can tell you this, like being a well-networked person for the last 24 years, there's nobody new entering early ed right now. We're really looking at people who are moving from program to program in search of a better environment and in search of better benefits. That's why we need to train more people. Right. Yeah, but who, right. Wants, who wants to be trained into a profession that underpays for really tough work is what 
I'm getting at. Right. Yeah. And has limited capacity in the public schools. Yeah. Right. Right. Which is a statewide issue. Right. Yeah. All right, so I'll get you um, program community um, numbers. Um, I can work with Tracy to figure out the lottery numbers, um, and I'll get you the link to the bill. You guys have my info. Um, I'm full time, so reach out um, and connect. Um, and I just sent um, like a page and a half email with all of the links around registration for next year to all of our partner programs today. Kind of in this gap between um, school day and here. So um, all of the materials are ready for next year. So if you have questions or you want to see them or you know check them out, email me and I can link you into those. They're all on Google Docs. So, so I think it's thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank so you. That's so helpful. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. And if we missed, like, if Libby and I missed anything with the brainstorming, like, let me know. And thank you so much for, like, allowing so much time and conversation. And like I said, I'm passionate and it's important. <coughs> so now we are having a little celebration and saying thank you and farewell to... Oh, do you want to do a calendar too? Oh, we need to do a calendar. Let's do the calendar first and then and we then can we say, can thank, say you thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the calendar as amended and set forth in front of you? Yep. Second. 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 Um, all those in favor? Aye. Uh, any opposed? Nay. Great. Thank you. We have a calendar. Um, I'm sorry, the rest of the consent agenda was approved. Yes. Yes. So we are all good. Um, now. Now. <laughs> yeah, so this is the last meeting. Um, we'll have Michelle and Tina with us as board members. You're always willing to drop by. Um, <laughs> we, we have public comment for we'll right? call about that, Michelle, session. and coordinate. Uh, <laughs> comment 630. Yeah. Really yeah. Um, yeah, but I would say thank you both. Uh, you both been here uh, before I was here, and it's been Wonderful working with, with both of you, and I, th and I think I speak on behalf of all the board, and I say thank you for all your time and effort. I know you both have worked extremely hard over the years and accomplished a lot of great things for the district and great things for our kids, um, and uh, I think the schools are are much better off as a result of the effort you've put in and the leadership you've shown on the board. So. Big thanks for me, and um, I think I think we have some sort of treat. Um, we do. And a couple of cards I have yet to sign. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we are so organized. <laughs> so Tina, Michelle, thank you. Good the Roxbury, come on over. Did you make that? I worked all day on this. <laughs> all day. <laughs> Maybe searching for a nice flower all over our office. And <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. And as a special, oh, thank you too. I thought you might need some relaxing time with a good book. <gasps> thank so, you. Cool. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, I don't know what I'm going to do with all my. I know. <laughs> for all the work that you've done. In Basket. <laughs> so, so we could take the cake into executive session. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure you get to peace. Yep. Um, okay. <laughs> so I think we need a. While we're doing that, why don't we have a motion for um, negotiations? All right, I move that uh, we find that discussing contract negotiations in open session would put the district at a disadvantage. Is that what you need? Yes. Okay. Um, I second. Yeah, and then do we want to add a quick discussion about to huh? Oh, about um, um, the board personnel two discussion contracts? and um, um, and personal evaluation. Yeah. Just. 
So motion to go in for those three reasons, the executive session? Oh, first of all, we need... You need to vote on that motion. We need to vote on that. Do we have a second? Yes. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now a motion to go to executive session. So the motion session. is to enter executive session for the purpose of discussing contract negotiations, personnel evaluation, and board personnel yes. discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? I'll second that. Tina said. <laughs> yeah.